everyone. It's Dennis here. I'm with Haley Fouch. Hello. And as you can tell, we're not in the usual podcast room for What the <laughs> Throne. It's a busy day here at Collider. Every like studio is being taken up. So we, we wanted to uh, do this uh, podcast, but we only had really one place to do it. The other choice was actually... Me Skyping you. Oh, boy. But us being in the same bill. Like, I would be <laughs> in my office, the office. And you would be here. <laughs> like, if we didn't have enough, like, cameras and studio times. But luckily, we at least got this going. This is much cozier. Yes, yeah. it is. Um, so, what we're going to be talking about, obviously, the we talked about, we had the finale review that you were on. I was on, Ashley and John Roca. Very, very heated uh, discussion, yeah. by the way. Um <laughs> Me and Ashley did a podcast of What the Throne right the day after, um, just kind of talking about, I'm trying to think, what, what do we finally decide? Oh, we did five quite unanswered questions, which oh. a lot of people, I'm sure there's more than just five. Sure, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, but today, I think, is kind of more of a, let's talk about the aftermath of the finale, because in more about the people's reactions to it. George R. R. Martin uh, posted a blog that some people are taking, at least not the same way that I am, because people are, are posting stuff like George R. R. Martin says his ending is completely different than the ending in the show, which is oh. not what he said. No. And I've seen headlines, uh, multiple headlines, not just one outlet, but multiple outlets saying ending of Game of Thrones book completely different than TV show. Mm. So... And then we'll talk about the petition. That's something I've been tweeting about against. Uh, some of the actors have uh, kind of spoken out against the, the mm -hmm. petitions as well. And just overall actors, quotes, and, and whatnot. Um, let, let's start off with the, the George R. R. Martin stuff. Yeah. Um, what did you take his blog post? If people you can go to georgerrmartin.com slash not a blog and see that post of talking about Game of Thrones as a whole. And then the ending as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it's sort of an echo of what he's been saying for a while, which is that they will be different in some respects by the demands of the medium, which mm -hmm. is that his story still has many characters who are still alive that are dead in the show for a long time. Uh, there are just writing changes that were made along the way on the show, eliminating certain plot points from the book that have obviously major fallout in his story as it unfolds. So they'll be different in that way. But he said time and time again, more or less, they're building up to the same thing. It's just that in his blog, he was very specific about the fact that he has characters and plot points that either were resolved way earlier in the mm -hmm. show or never came up at all. So in that way, it'll be different. But I don't see this as him saying, it's going to be a sweeping, different, complete revolution of the ending you saw. Yeah, I think a lot of people have gravitated towards this blog and taking it as, oh he's unhappy with the ending of Game of Thrones, the TV show, and he's writing his own ending, and it's going to be vastly different. I'm sure he's going to take note of what people were upset about, mm -hmm. but I think he, I think he's still going to hit the same notes. I think he's going to be like, okay, well, Daenerys is, is going to do something that will show that she, you know, was led not led i guess her character went down a different path than we expected mm -hmm. um I'm, I'm sure probably the brand thing was probably his as well that's got to be his that reads like so much george r. r martin and as ashley brought up on the the review you know his is the first perspective chapter of the book so it mm -hmm. makes sense that his would also be the last mm -hmm. um but yeah i think that's I don't know if you saw the actress who plays Brienne, Gwendolyn Christie. Yes. She called it yes. years ago. Yes. And her justification was that's the George R. R. Martin thing to do. Yeah. And it's funny because, I mean, some people will be like, well, she's on the show. Trust me, she does not know. They do not know. No. I mean, that's been a, actually a complaint from some of the actors is they wish they had known where their characters were going so they could have played the lead up differently mm -hmm. because it is so secretive for them as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, talking about the uh, actors' reactions, because also those things are being taken out of context and used for a lot of clickbaity headlines. Yeah. Like, I, I read one that said, like, Amelia Clark hated what happened to her character and wants reshoots. Oh, wow. Which, that's not what, you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they, they parsed, like, a, an interview, and then they, they somehow exaggerated and 
transformed what she said. Of course. Uh, yeah, she was upset about the ending for her character as she read the script, but that's not that's not not normal. That's like not weird because when actors read their scripts to their characters, it's, it has nothing to do with this is just to to you know be honest like they're not thinking okay what does the story look like as a whole they look at what does my character <laughs> right. look like right yeah they're not thinking about the story uh, like oh, okay does this serve this story they're looking at like okay cuz they cuz if you look at um i remember some uh, there was an interview with um who oh, am i blanking on his name Jason Momoa mm -hmm. and he was like i can't believe like you know Daenerys got killed by Jon Snow. Like, if I was there, I would come back and kill Jon. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> he's still very protective of Amelia Clark yes. and Daenerys as a character because he played Khal Drogo. So it's like that's the perspective that the actors are coming at. Not, you know, and in, in no way did she say like the ending sucked. It's terrible. We need to do reshoots of the whole thing right i think that she has been one of the more vocally critical actors mm -hmm. as the season has sort of been teed up and gone on and ended she was the one who was more outspoken and saying that she had a lot of feelings about mm -hmm. the end and but i at least not to what i've seen has she ever said we should have reshot it no which i don't think is something any actor in that capacity would ever say no, no. And I, I do think, too, people do get, actors do get critical about what happens with their characters because to them, they're just that they're alter egos, yeah. right? And so if a character that she thought was a, a good character, and she even mentioned that, oh, so that's why they had me play certain scenes mm -hmm. a certain way earlier on. In, and I mean, I'm not talking about just the season. I'm talking about, like, way previous seasons that they knew this is where her character was heading and sort of like, okay, you need to, you know, play this, you know, more like a petulant child or, or, or these things. And so, and then now it makes more sense to her. It makes more sense to us now. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think that part of that is, of course, the same way and probably even more that we get attached to these characters and they mean a lot to us. She spent 10 years playing this character, mm. so for her to get that final blow is probably pretty intense emotionally to how she had built, you know, Daenerys up in her mind. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I think if you people reading that, maybe reading too much into her initial reactions to it. And, and look, and we've said this before, it's not that we think the ending is perfect no. and that the whole season eight was perfect and there's nothing wrong with it. We have our own criticisms of the show and the season and where certain characters went and whatnot. And it's, it's, it's just more about, I think, accepting that's what, you know, what they did was what they had to work with, yeah. I guess. And especially with the, with the time crunch and it's, it, and it's not invalid for people to be upset or to criticize the season. I, I think more of at least my, uh, I guess criticism of fans comes from the sense of entitlement mm -hmm. that people have with with like the whole petition thing and reshooting or or that that really like um, jump from this show is awesome. This is the worst show ever right. made. Like right. really, Game of Thrones is the worst show ever made just because season eight wasn't the best season out of them all. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I definitely have had an emotional journey yeah. on this final season. I, I feel that the, uh, the fourth and fifth episode were, were a real dark, dark moment of the soul for me where I was rather an angry fan. And mm -hmm. maybe, you know, I had to confront myself and be like, is this a sense of entitlement? I don't think that's where it came from no. for me. It was a sense of sadness of, of how many years of my life I put into this story, mm -hmm. even reading the books before the show started. And then being like, this is what they had time to give me. Yeah. And I felt mad for two episodes. Yeah. But that had worn off for me a little bit by the finale, which allowed me to take it, I think, in a bit of stride. Also, genuinely, like the things that I wanted to see happen mostly happened, mm -hmm. aside from Bran, which I don't think anybody wanted to see that. Yeah. But so that, that helps me be less angry. But in general, it's like, it's natural to almost sort of 
grieve the sense that you had hoped these characters you love would get a firmer rev resolution, but also you, you talk about the sense of entitlement and that's where like the petition comes in and, and a lot of the folks signing the petition of which there are literally more than a million now. So mm -hmm. it's, it's obvious that this is a issue a lot of people share. Mm -hmm. They say it's more about the message than about actually having them reshoot it, which I understand. But the, the conflict there is I think a lot of these fans are like, we love the directors, we love the actors, we love the storyboard artists, mm -hmm. the costume designer, we're just so mad at Benioff and Weiss. Yeah. But that doesn't just come across as an insult to Benioff and Weiss. It comes across as an insult to the whole cast and crew, to why we've seen people like Sophie Turner speak out against it. Uh, there's, I believe, a, a production artist who was on Twitter like, man, you guys are breaking our heart. Like, yeah. it, it, it's a complicated thing that I, I think is interesting because it shatters this illusory debate we've been having about fans versus critics mm -hmm. versus creators because now it's creators versus fans, which mm -hmm. we haven't seen in a while, or I guess Star Wars, but yeah. like uh, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing and it's not a two-sided conversation. It's a multi-sided conversation that is very hard to translate nuance into a petition. Yes. And also the way the petition was, well, first of all, I think online petitions that deal with, you know, stuff like this are pretty pointless. Yeah. I mean, saying that it's a message, it's like, trust me, HBO knows. They, they, right. list the, they can just go on Twitter and they know what, the, what people think. They don't need a petition. Also, the way the petition was written was like, we need to hire competent writers, not Benioff and White. That's basically the gist mm -hmm. of the petition. Um, I think, yeah, there's a sense of entitlement there where it's like, okay, and people are like, I invested all this time into it. It's like, okay, but I mean, if you don't like it, you don't like it, and that's fair to voice your opinion, but like, if you didn't like, let's say, the ending of season eight or whatever, it's, I don't know, you, you it's not like you paid for the production of the thing, yeah. like... I don't know. It's it's one of the things where I just think people are just taking it a, a a bit a bit too far. I agree. They're always these petitions are always goofy. Mm -hmm. Equally goofy to me is the amount of attention they receive, which only creates a bigger, longer conversation mm -hmm. and more signatures and more back and mm -hmm. forth. Um, but it's just it's just one of those things that I find is always the case on the internet where there's room for a, a nuanced, interesting conversation, mm -hmm. but it just keeps getting turned into an either or. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really misses a lot of, I don't know, joy that you could be having because I do not like season eight and I did not really like season seven. Mm -hmm. I think that's when they really started rushing and not, yes. not trying as hard and, Maybe not trying as hard is the wrong phrase, yeah. but but not giving as much attention and nuance to the details. Um, but that has never undermined to me the value of the seasons that came before. And mm -hmm. I, I totally understand that knowing how a story ends and hating how it ends can, mm -hmm. can sort of taint the rest of the story. Yeah. But I also feel like you can't take seasons one through four from me. They are gold. Mm -hmm. They are in my heart, and I don't care what you did in those last two seasons. They're still amazing. Yes, and for me, five and six were, were great as well. Yeah. So for me, it's like seven, eight or definitely have the most things to criticize. Um, you, you mentioned something very interesting, too. You said the creators versus the fans versus instead of like the critics versus the fans. Because I find that very interesting because in this particular case, you have also, let's say, a decent amount of critics that did not like this this season yeah. or especially I think the last few episodes and you see fans using that like oh look look the critics didn't like it either it's like choose a side because yeah. <laughs> because these are the same people that were like for uh, the last Jedi like I forgot where last Jedi ended up on the Rotten Tomatoes thing but it was probably like 80 something or positive, something it, it yeah. was a positive thing Oh, the critics suck. Mm -hmm. Blah blah blah. You 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 can't you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's, it's one or the other. Either you think the critics suck and you know they they you know they don't have a sense of what the 
I guess uh, the regular movie goer slash TV watcher does, or, or they do. It's just, it's not to say you have to agree with them all the time. What I'm saying is like using that, like, because I've seen a lot of articles like, look at the critics and look how it's gone down. It's like, okay, you're the same people who are like, oh, you critics don't know anything. Mm-hmm. So, And it's not just like, unfortunately, that conversation isn't just between fans and critics anymore. It's mm-hmm. really crossed a certain boundary into the discourse of creators and actors where you hear it all the time. We didn't make this for critics. We made it for the fans. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's uh, I think, a completely unhelpful dialogue that has become really sort of, it's been made official in recent years, and we've seen multiple times throughout industries, throughout music, fashion, uh, film, comedy, entertainment recently, mm-hmm. celebrities taking an anti-critic stance online. Yeah, yes. And it gets much more complicated when it's the fans who are angry in line with the critics because then e- nobody can just point an easy finger at that point. Yeah, uh, that's another good point you, you make. All, let's say if we, we look at the studio slash filmmakers angle, they also do the flip-flop as well because with the critics, it's like if the critics don't like their movie, they say, well, we made it for the fans, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but then when it, the critics do love it, they're like, oh, yes, like they're, they're happy to have that approval. Ninety percent on Rotten Tomatoes yeah, exactly. on every trailer. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's one of those things where yeah, people, both fans and the studios, filmmakers and critics alike are, are just like uh, when it suits them, whichever the way the wind blows. It's like okay, uh, oh yeah, the fans don't like it either, so I'm right. Or the critics don't. It's like I don't know. I I just feel like it it, it should be like um. It's just more consistent thing where it's like you either you like it or you don't. And if other people don't like it or do like it, it's like not really proof, I guess, yeah. of, of whether something is good or bad. I agree 100 <laughs> percent. And also it does no good to box uh, viewers into particular categories. Yes, Critics is a professional film group subset of yeah. people that exist, but... The term fans is very nebulous. Many critics are fans. Yes. And it, it, you know, fans do not fit into one box that you can say, well, the fans like it. So all of this is in, in an interesting way when people have those conversations. They're really talking more about culture than they are actually talking about the piece of art in question. Mm-hmm. I find that interesting. They're really revealing more about themselves than they are about the art they're trying to discuss, mm-hmm. which is just... The internet, again, <laughs> not a lot of room for nuance, but I, I think it's valuable to sort of point those those conversational dynamics out so that we can hopefully sift through them to get to what we actually want to talk about, which is the show, right? Yeah. That's that's the valuable content. Yes. The analyzing of the show and, and you know, t- t- I think because some people will go, well, then what's the point of critics or whatever? And it's like... Mm. Critics aren't the end all be all of whether, you know, movies. I think people take the the opinion of critics too seriously in some ways because it's like they're giving their opinion and then you can agree with it or not. And the point is you find a critic that either you like or you have similar interests and tastes with and then you follow them. And also if they can break down and analyze something that you may have not seen before. I mean, exactly. People, I think you have to realize critics read other critics' stuff. Yeah. And then you look at it and you're like, oh, I totally disagree with them. Or you're like, wow, I didn't think about it from that perspective that you may not have agreed with them. Oh, yeah. So it's, 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 it's I don't know. It's just one of those things where, like you said, it's, it's much more nuanced than yeah. just the hate love. Hate <laughs> love. Thumbs up, thumbs down. I mean, for me, as someone who works as a critic, I try to consider my job not to tell you what's good or bad that's up to you but to bring the the analysis and perspective and illumination on it that only my personal experience can bring that only any individual writer's experience and knowledge can bring i i don't that's you know that's a deeper conversation about the value of rotten tomatoes Mm -hmm. but again this binary look at criticism isn't at all what i think our job actually is yeah uh, and then speaking, you know, in, in conjunction with, with Game of Thrones, I also think that, um, 
just kind of this whole nature of like it's like the worst show ever <laughs> now yeah. because of the ending right. like it's I, I guess the we live in an age of hyperbole uh especially on the internet where it's like are you sure are you sure you can uh you can prove that this is the worst show ever. I've seen some really bad shows, you guys. You should watch more TV. There's a lot out there. Yeah. I mean, just because the way the ending ended up. And, and you know, I have a feeling George R. R. Martin, when he ends up write, you know, writing these books, supposedly, I, I guess he, like, promised that that he will have Winds of Winter done by the end of next summer. He did. Um, He's made promises before. Yes. <laughs> um, so I think when people read that and you, whether or not how close it is to what we saw in the TV show, I think uh, a lot of people will will read it and go, oh, that's the way it should have been done, you right. know. But the problem is he didn't write it. And he didn't, I mean, finish writing it before mm -hmm. they started I mean, working on the show, which is, you know, with season seven and eight, that stuff was like years ago when they started planning. Yeah. It wasn't just like, oh, it came out, uh, the season eight just ended. They just started shooting it a few months ago <laughs> or something like that. You know, it's like they've been planning these two seasons for a long, long time. And so... Uh, and all any of the insights that they tried to get from George R. R. Martin, they, I'm sure they utilized as much as they could. They just didn't have all the nitty gritty details on how to get there. Yeah. And it really I think that if you are a book reader and you watch these last two seasons, you watch the, you know, the sort of resource of time become very limited then you really start to feel the the plot threads that were excised out of the book and mm -hmm. you start to see how they might be important to the end of the story even though it may be it's fine that they weren't in the show but certainly i go like ah i suddenly understand why that character was in there because this character's journey doesn't make as much sense without that there to change their mind about something mm -hmm. And that just becomes more escalated when they have to condense what they have anyway into these short seasons. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Uh, there's nothing we can do about the time they yeah. decided to take with it. And I think that's where a lot of the, the, like, the real anger is coming from, like a feeling of helplessness of like, you just, you just quit on us, guys. Like There was more story to tell and you just bailed, kind of. Mm -hmm. Which is understandable. Like I said, I had a dark moment of the soul for two episodes where I was <laughs> very angry at Benny Offenweiss. Um, but also they did spend 10 years on this show and there's only so much. I know their contract was ironclad. I'm still working out my feelings about them not being willing to like maybe pass it on to different mm -hmm. showrunners or something like that. But it's just something I found more peace in accepting and then taking my joy of the seasons that I love and mm -hmm. leaving the rest rather than sitting there and being angry about it. Let me ask you, when you do your rewatch of yeah. Game of Thrones, will you be watching season seven and eight? That'll be interesting to discover, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I found myself struggling on the rewatch I did before this mm -hmm. uh, as I got closer to season seven, because I think season six a little rough too, but oh, still really? pretty good. I, really, I love season. I six. I know a lot of people do, and yeah. I I respect it. I just it's when I started to feel them cutting corners essentially, mm -hmm. um, like characters that I had really invested in just being killed off kind of quickly or off screen or not showing us reaction shots to things we'd really want to see the reaction about mm -hmm. little details like that. Um, but I did feel myself slowing down as I got closer to seven, uh -huh. and then seven was pretty hard to get through. <laughs> So now that there's no more new episodes ahead of me, I might bail out. Do okay. you think you'll finish? Uh, I will. I will. I definitely will. Just because to me, it's like the journey from the beginning to the end. However, I mean, the thing is, is because, you know, we're watching this year to year. Season one, I've seen the most because I, when I do the rewatches, I have to start back at season one, right? So when I watch season two, I rewatch season one before I watch season two. Mm -hmm. Before season three, I rewatch one, two, and th you know what I mean? Like, so yeah, yeah. all the earlier seasons, 
my rewatches on those keep going <laughs> yeah. up and up and up, you know? So I, I definitely think I will watch more of the earlier seasons. I do love, yeah, like with season six, like there's some of my favorite stuff is in season six. Like it's, 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 it's season four and six to me are my two favorite ones. Mm-hmm. Um, which is weird. I, I do need to talk to Ashley about why she doesn't like season four. Oh, that's interesting. That's usually one of the most loved. Yes, she made mm-hmm. a comment on our review the last week. Oh. She said it made her ill. Interesting. So, I mean, there was some controversial stuff, I guess, but I would be curious to know that too. I'm a I'm a one in three gal. Okay, those are w- one is pretty awesome. Yeah, those are my jam, and they feel probably because they feel like exactly like the book okay. almost. <laughs> oh, speaking of that. Um, so I said that uh, I purposely waited until the series was over yeah. to start the book. So I started the Audible version of the book. It's it's funny because it's like I'm, th- I think, three hours into it. And it's like in in uh, in parallel to the TV series, that was episode one. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. So I listened to three hours <laughs> and I'm at the point where they – push brand out the window you uh-huh. know and it's like but so far it's been pretty much the same mm-hmm. um they extend their stay at winterfell much longer uh, which i'm sure like in the story of the tv series that it's the same they just don't show it because it's like no one wants to see i think there's like a scene with like uh we we do see Arya and Sansa like knitting, but mm-hmm. there's like a scene with Marcella's there, and then Jane Poole, which apparently is a much bigger character. Ah, Jane Poole, <laughs> much bigger character. Get used to her; she's sticking around. Yes, yeah. uh, in in the book series, non-existent in the TV show. Uh, but yeah, yeah, and that's one of those characters where, that George Martin is talking about, kind of. That's like. There are a lot of threads still dangling that mm-hmm. either don't matter on the show or were wrapped up real quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So I haven't gotten to the part really where like super branching off of yeah. what the TV series. Right now it's like pretty much the TV series, though the characters are still different, even though they're this, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like uh, Tyrion's supposed to be like this ugly yes. troll. and. Peter Dinklage is not an ugly man. Very you know? handsome yeah, man. He's yeah. a good looking, good looking guy. Um, and just a lot of things. Like I think he's, Joff- a, he's acrobatic for some reason. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Joffrey's supposed to be tall and thin. He is, you know, not so much. Obviously, the ages are. are They're different. all like 10 years younger. Yes. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so just slight little differences so far. I'm sure they'll. And I'm glad I saved it because now I guess maybe that's why my grieving process of <laughs> this, this year is being over is not as bad as i had thought because now as someone who hasn't read the books i have all the books to yeah. look forward to and i will get to hear and be introduced to new characters and new storylines that didn't exist in the show absolutely and then i can be really mad and upset yeah. <laughs> when, when 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 uh when i'm done and be like oh my god i can't believe they didn't use this or whatever uh, absolutely i mean there's I'll be curious to see if you mind by the time you reach the big divergences because you did know the show's version first. Yeah, uh, I will say it actually has helped a lot in me listening to the the audio book because since I know all the main characters, because yeah. the, the thing is when you read a new book, because I, you know, I, I listen to a lot of the Star Wars no- novels, the canon novels now, and the hardest thing is it's usually like, one character maybe you know sometimes not even one character you know and like you have to just you know the star wars universe but you don't know any of these characters you don't know what their situation is you don't know who's who and you have to get it takes like this i guess a bit of time for you to like actually invest yourself into the story and the characters with this i don't have to yeah (laughs) i am already invested into the characters and the story so when they say so and so and so and so, I was like, I, I know who that is. You got a shorthand. Yes, and I already visualize, even though it's not exactly the same description as in the TV show. At least I know who they're talking about and yeah. what their what their position is. Because I, I can't imagine like if I if let's say I never watched the TV show and I started listening to this audiobook, I'd be like, 
who's that and what's it? It's and a lot. What? It, but now because I know what the Targaryens are, I know what the House Sigils and the mottos and because I remember even just watching the show for the first time, it was a lot. And mm-hmm. that's a, you know, TV is a visual medium and that took a lot. It's, I mean, there are an astounding number of characters when it starts. Most of them get killed by the end, which is, I think, also something that maybe led to the the feeling of it being rushed. I mean, it was rushed, but yes. also just that uh, the, the drama of a show that once was such a rich tapestry became the story of like 10 people instead, mm-hmm. which is a totally different vibe than as we're talking about this like endless dictionary of characters you're first introduced to. Yeah, and also locations. Because remember, they were yeah. all like in separate locations. And now when you start coming, like when Jon Snow's storyline merges with Daenerys' storyline, merges with Tyrion's storyline, with Sansa and Ar- they're all gathered in the <laughs> yeah. same place and they're all in the same storyline. Because mm-hmm. by the end, I mean, one of my criticisms of the last season was, you know, Cersei like didn't have much to do. They didn't loved really... that window. She just yeah, loved yes. it. Like they, I thought there was going to be more with her. Like, of course. Uh, I thought there was going to be some other uh, machinations going on in King's Landing, but not really. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so that was one of the things that, I'm interested to see how that plays out in the book. Same. And that's, I think that's like kind of getting back to what we were first talking about. I wouldn't be surprised if Cersei's, you know, final chapters play out very differently in the last Mm -hmm. book. But ultimately, I think they'll likely arrive at pretty much the same destination, which is her and Jamie dying together. Uh, Maybe he'll write it slightly differently so that, it fulfills the prophecies as well, you know, but I, I don't, I think that the difference will come in, I've said this before, but not, not what happens, but how it happens. Mm-hmm. I also noticed uh, something today. I saw something online today. Of, um, someone posted this, like, this is the, there was a leaked script for season eight. And then when it got leaked, that's when they decided to change the whole thing. And then oh. they gave like a breakdown it's like it's fan fiction. Mm-hmm. It's literally fan fiction that like someone wrote for themselves. Okay. And they basically wanted everyone to tell them how much better their <laughs> story or season was. It, it's basically a breakdown of each episode and like an episode one well, it has like you're on like like being like I don't know, a much bigger role and like and the whole Night King zombie stuff is like taken all the way to king's landing Mm -hmm. okay well there's no way that's real yes exactly there's a lot of things in there like no that that would never happen this would never happen etc etc you know so there was um a leak that was from like a pretty well-known leaker that had a very different ending Mm -hmm. for one of the characters so i i'm i'm pretty convinced that they shot multiple endings but there's no way that it could have been so different as, you know, the Night King making it to King's Landing. No. That doesn't happen. No. Uh, d- yeah, you sent this this article. Do you want to talk about what they thought Oh, about? yeah. So that's another interesting thing. Um, the writers, or one of the writers, kind of discussed with, with people today, I believe, that they had a different ending for Jorah okay. that almost happened where he was going to make it to the end and ride north with John and Tormund. Mm-hmm. And that ultimately they decided to change that because they felt the character deserved his noble death defending the woman he loves. And that's, I mean, that's interesting mm-hmm. because that's a pretty significant difference. And that definitely throws a, uh, questions at the how similar will it be to the book thing? Mm-hmm. Because if one version of their script had him not even die a different way, straight up live, mm-hmm. And the other one, he's Mr. Meat Shield. That's yeah. that's a big difference. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I that, that makes sense though because I think if he had lived, it would have complicated things in King's Landing mm-hmm. because then at that point is he, one is he going to keep following Daenerys? I mean, he, he loves her obviously, but you have the whole like. The unsullied killing the Lannister prisoners, the whole, you know, Daenerys 
killing innocent children and you know what i mean and then the the end the sequence between daenerys and Jon snow it's like where's jorah at that moment right like so i can understand why they kind of wrote oh, him out of that i definitely can too i think it's uh i found that his death for me was one of the more satisfying elements mm-hmm. of season eight so i'm glad they went that way but I do think it, it throws a little <clears throat> fuel on the fire of how different will the books be if, if a character that, to me, I know a lot of people might not feel this, I've, I consider Jorah a very major character mm-hmm. in the story, and if his fate was left open in that regard, that's interesting. And I think it's probably more that, you know, like the, the major points, again, Bran, Danny dying, Jon Snow going north, Sansa Queen in the north, mm-hmm. these things will be the same, but all the rest is really up for grabs. Yeah. I do think the Daenerys uh, burning yeah. innocent children, I think that was George R. R. Martin. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, I mean, how we get there and what happens after might be different. Uh, I think it, it'll be much longer, yeah, yeah. you know, yes, like a lot more pages will be dedicated to her shifting mind. And because the, 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 ugh, the chapters are told from first person perspective, we get to be in her head as she goes mad. Which, yes, which makes things a lot easier yes. for, for <laughs> the books versus the tv show because unless you're going to do internal dialogue voiceover which game of thrones never has done and they're not going to introduce it at the very last season yeah i mean they barely introduce like flashbacks you know like how many flat there's probably like five flashbacks total in the yeah. whole series super minimal yeah they don't really use that that storytelling convention which, which they totally could with bran they could yes. have them all the time yeah so, um, I don't know. Is there anything else you want to talk about in terms of like the ending, the, the fans response to the ending critics response, the, I mean, it just seems like, I don't know. It seems like a big mess. It does. <laughs> it it is. I mean, I just, my take on it is your feelings are valid. Just do do something with them like have a have a conversation with them not not yelling at somebody or uh you know if you if you want to take them out go ahead to some some subreddits that are full of sass (laughs) like go ahead get your feelings out but you know when you when you do sort of like a a blunt instrument like a petition you also have to be aware that it is going to read poorly to all the actors and craftsmen who you you respect even though you don't like what the writers did Mm. and uh i just you know take your feelings and do something with them (laughs) would be would be my closing sentiment and and your feelings are valid and they're they're better if you use them to do something interesting or have an interesting conversation than just to just be mad yeah and one or two how many of like like the people that are upset that and and it's probably a good portion of people that never read the books Mm -hmm. are going to go read the books i'd say probably a minimal amount of people that actually put in the effort i mean there there are a lot of pages yeah (laughs) i mean it's the same thing i say all the time with with the comic book stuff like yeah avengers endgame like made you know i guess it's the second at this as we're recording this (laughs) is the second one by the time this comes out, maybe it becomes number <laughs> one. I don't know. But think about how many people actually read comic books. Yeah. It's like this this much. And even after all the, the movies and how much money they made, maybe increases the viewers or the readership by a little bit, a mm-hmm. tiny bit. But that's it. I mean, people aren't willing to put in the efforts right. into a lot of stuff. I, I get. I mean, I do think that they should stand on their own in each individual yes. medium. But I also, I think that's a good suggestion that if you're very frustrated, take the time to read the books. There's a lot there to to soak in that might help, as you said, with the grieving process. <laughs> it's definitely helping with mine. Yeah, and mine is not so much. I mean, yes, I am disappointed in in season eight, but not like, oh my god, it's so terrible and awful. Uh, whatever. It, it's just more like, oh, it's over. I don't get Game of Thrones anymore. I mean, the prequel series, we, you know, I'm looking forward to that. But remember, that's none of these characters. Yeah. It's not the same time period. It's, you know, I'm sure a lot of things will be different. But I'm, I'm happy that I get to go into the books now 
and get to see like a b- even deeper uh i guess deeper knowledge and information into the into the stories it's like you get to go even like if the world of game of thrones is this forest or thicket or whatever you get to go way deep into the trees when you read the books as opposed to just sort of looking at the outlines on the show yeah it's uh it's a cool thing i mean and it's i really really hope above all that these books do come out (laughs) like please 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 but also, um, I'm really hoping there's more of a sense of closure in the ending because the weirdest part of the finale to me mm-hmm. is how much more interested I am in what comes after it than I was in anything that happened this season. So you're talking about like Arya going west of Westeros. Yeah, Sansa John- ruling. Jon Snow going up to north. The north. Yeah, and you know, unanswered questions like if, if Beric died immediately after serving his purpose that the Lord of Light brought him back for, then what was John's purpose? Obvi- I guess we're meant to assume he hasn't fulfilled it yet, but because he's still alive. Mm-hmm. But things like that, you know, a, a, a firm sense of resolution and conclusion as opposed to me just going, oh, that story looks so cool. What happens now? Yeah, apparently a lot of people were talking about uh, the whole, like, they should make an Arya spinoff, and I yeah. guess... Uh, one of the execs from HBO was, no, we're not doing that. They're not doing it, apparently. You know what? But I'm going to steal a line from Tyrion. Ask him in 10 years. Yeah. They love money. That's true. That's true. I mean, also, it depends on Maisie Williams. Like, yeah. In 10 years, maybe she'll be at a place where it's like, oh, you know what? I feel ready to, to take on this. Yeah. And hers is one you could feasibly do without having to bring back every character, yes. you know? Yes. And you could do it like, I guess the one issue would be you kind of would want to see her enter wherever she's going right in the beginning. So like if she's aged up, it's gonna, I guess be a little weird. Yeah. Like if she's already, cause the whole thing is about exploring a new place that she's never been to, that nobody has been to before. But How is that? That's so cool. How do you end it on that and not tell us what is west of Westeros? Come on, Bran, just tell us. Yeah, he he knows he knows it all. He knows he's keeping <laughs> it. All right, guys, uh, that's it for this episode of What the Throne. Uh, Haley, uh, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Haley Fouch. You can find me on Instagram at Haystack McGroovy, and you can find me on Collider dot com, where I'm posting stuff pretty much every day. Cool. And you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero, our Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Make sure to subscribe to the, our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos. Subscribe to the Collider Factory feed for What the Throne. And also, I think the next episode, we're going to talk about the document. Even though I think by the time this episode comes out, you have seen the documentary. But we will talk about the... Is it a two-hour documentary or is it a one-hour? I think it might be a two-hour documentary. I think it's a full feature length, yeah. Great. I'm excited to, to see that and uh, see if there's any more discussions that could be had uh, of the behind the scenes. I, I love behind the scenes. That's the whole reason why, even though I'm subscribed to HBO, I still buy the Blu-rays <laughs> so I can watch the behind the scenes stuff. Nice. And you are definitely stoked on this. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be cool, but I'm curious to see if it will be watched because of how people were feeling yeah side note well the, my whole point of the the because the the series finale obviously ha- had the highest ratings of them all yeah. you know had the people who had signed that petition beforehand not watched because they hated it so much they uh definitely wouldn't have achieved that it, it, everyone's like ah it's so terrible I and mean, then they can't stop watching it yeah Yeah. you're hooked man they they did a real good job getting us hooked from from the early days there's no way we weren't going to watch that finale all right guys until next time see you guys later